Everybody, whether you're the president of a company or the paperboy, everybody has the exact same amount of time. You and I both have 24 hours a day. No more, no less. The question is, what do you do with your time? Real quick, my friends, go get my new book. It's called The Power to Publish. And it's at the top of the page of zbooks.co at the link, my new book. And it's going to help you with all of your self-publishing needs. Okay, back to that podcast. Welcome to the ZBooks Successful Authors Podcast. And with me today, I have a historical man. He is the Nostradamus of the medicine industry. And it is fair to say he was a key player in the healthcare reform movement. Help me welcome Dr. Eddie Price. Hello, doctor. How are you? I'm very well, thank you, Eric. <laughs> no problem, Dr. Eddie. So can I call you Eddie or Dr. Eddie? Eddie will do. Eddie's fine. Whatever you prefer for your listeners. <laughs> okay. So... The, it's, you have a rich history. You, you, you've been a doctor since the 70s, right? So, so tell me about this. Um, yeah, you were talking about proms, and, and one of the very first things you, you did that, that uh, gave you the moniker of the, the kind of like the Nostradamus of the industry. Yeah, well, I was uh, sitting at a, a hospital administrator because I didn't like uh, – put up with uh, sick people being very sick in front of me. So I went into health management and uh, they said, well, what is quality health care in the hospital I was working at? And uh, they, we came up with a questionnaire about patient satisfaction with the hospital service. And I said, wait on, something's missing there. The patient came in the hospital to get better. And have, what do we mean by better? And better meant healthier. And I said, well, what is health? And if the person had a cataract, they came into hospital to get it operated so they could see better, improve their function, their cataract wouldn't kill them. And if they had a bad hip, they wanted to function better with less pain. And the only way to do that was to uh, have a questionnaire to the patients. And I devised a questionnaire for the patients back in 1973 uh, that are now being called PROMS, Patient Reported Outcome Measures, and being widely advocated in the last five years. And uh, are they not now in, uh, becoming an industry standard or ubiquitous? They're, they are starting to become ubiquitous because they measure quality of life. They've been used by Big Pharma uh, to test new drugs as they go on to the market, of drugs for cancer in particular, that they're not so harmful to your quality of life. And uh, so they've got a rich history there. And there's now some 2,000 uh, of these questionnaires that are being developed by universities using underlying what they call psychometrics to make sure they're valid and reliable measures of a person's functional health status. And that was all the way back in 72 or 73? 73, yeah, but I, I also then asked the question of myself, well, what else are we trying to do And as doctors and came up with two, other th two or three other things? One was to prevent disease and disability, and then how could you measure prevention? And I found the same thing could apply with PROMS or these questionnaires about people people's risk factors, whether they smoked and so forth, that could also be scored using the same technology for functional health status. And there was also a question of relieving distress 
or caring, what we call the health care industry. And caring comes into place because if somebody is injured badly in a motor vehicle accident and uh, they're quite dependent on somebody stopping to look after them and caring for them, that is taking over their basic physical and mental activities on behalf of the patient. And also, if the first patient is under anaesthetic, they're totally reliant on the doctor or the hospital to care, to do the right thing by them. So there were two other questionnaires in the area of prevent, preventive proms and uh, cared for proms that I call that are at the moment still unique to us, but the world has moved to what they call functional health status proms or now called value-based healthcare outcomes that matter to the patient. I think, um, I think people listening probably don't really realize how profound this is. We were talking about Pareto a minute ago. Uh, can you kind of break it down for uh, uh, you know, the, the novices out there, what, this, what the impact is? Yeah, well, the impact is in, in Germany, and maybe even in Hamburg, um, not sure, I forget the name, but for, for instance, prostate cancer operations, um, the whole world has a 95% survival rate in prostate cancer, but this one hospital in Germany has only the complication of impotency that's failure to get erections or incontinence, that is the loss of urine, of around five to six percent, while all the other hospitals in the world are around 25 to 30 percent. So only by using a PROMS questionnaire did they discover that this hospital is doing outstanding work and this really mattered to the patients because who wants to have those side effects? So uh, I don't know how it works. I'm not a doctor, but <laughs> how did the other yeah. hospitals find out about this one successful hospital and then implement it? Uh, because that successful hospital was using PROMS and through the work of an organization created by Professor Michael Porter of Harvard Business School called ICHOM, he disseminated these results. And these results, that is the, the effect on the patient's quality of life and what mattered to patients was only being no, known from these questionnaires. And therefore, other hospitals have been encouraged uh, by this to all use these questionnaires to determine not only the fact that they've kept the patient alive, prolonged their life a little longer, but their quality of life is such that they are happy in those extra years of life that they may have gained. That's interesting. So, yeah, improving people's lives, that's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Is that what made and, you want to be a doctor? Uh, Oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> You're right. No, I'm, well, I came from a long line of doctors and I made the mistake as a child because my father was a doctor. Um, we had cats having kittens and uh, we saw the birth and one pair of kittens were came out in the one sack. Babies are born in a sack. And then three weeks later, um, one of the kittens was weaker than the other. And I said to my father, age seven, oh, it might have been one of the twins. And my father said, oh, I told you so, it's in the genes. He's born to be a doctor. <laughs> so to please my father, I became a doctor. Cool. And then uh, what got you into writing? Uh, well, when I became a doctor and wasn't comfortable with particularly young kids with cancer and so forth. I looked for my area within medicine and I ended up being sent when I worked in Israel to a deserted 
uh, Egyptian hospital in the Sinai in a town called El Arish. And we, the young doctors back then in 1971, had to run the hospital. And I realized I could go into health management and run the hospitals, and that would, I'd have a profession there. So I studied management, and in the course, um, they said that in order to manage anything, you need to measure it. And you need to measure it, and by looking at what we were measuring or not measuring, I saw we were only measuring about 10 or 12 percent of what doctors and hospitals did, and the other 88 percent is not being measured. That is trying to improve people's health related quality of life, trying to prevent illness, and trying to be more caring. And all of these could be measured by these questionnaires that needed then to be scored. So I devised a questionnaire that covered all the areas that I thought were important. That is the, the health related quality of life, a person's cared for status and their preventive or positive health status, otherwise called wellness. That's cool. You, you, so you invented that in Egypt first, where some of the uh, oldest well, known, yeah, yeah, go on. Sorry. Well, well, some yeah. of the oldest known, yeah, medical drawings are right on the pyramids and stuff. Huh? Sure, sure, <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a good point. Yeah. So yeah, going back there, that's certainly the tradition and what I. Uh, I devised was these, uh, they have to be short questionnaires and they have to be accurate. So mm -hmm. then in the States, the RAND Corporation spent millions developing some of these questionnaires, in particular one that covers all illnesses. And mm -hmm. that started off being a two hour questionnaire and they cut it down to ended up being a six minute questionnaire that they ended up calling the SF36 short form 36 questions, which became an international standard around the world for, wow. for proms. Now, have you heard about um, uh, the um, chat bots? So I've heard that there are some medical websites or hospital websites, I don't know, and, and the person goes and goes and then to the chat bot and the chat bot has questions in it. And it was found out that the chat bots could diagnose things more accurately, more consistently than humans. Have you heard that one? I have heard that that's a uh, possibility in doing that, but uh, yeah, I still think that uh, the people like the person-to-person -person, uh, connection, but I'm open to all changes in, uh, in new technology. But what these questionnaires have that we're talking about has a lot of science or what's called psychometrics behind it. So they have to have be valid and reliable and repeatable. And they're being developed by universities around the world. Mm -hmm. uh, very active university is Northwest in uh, Chicago. And they've set up what the American government calls an organization called PROMISE, Patient Reported Outcome Measures Information System. And uh, they've got a new... Uh, website called uh, health measures that have many of these or some of their measures available for people to use it sounds kind of like the the start of big data or the basis for big data you know what i mean where they're they're collecting so much information and then you can use uh that and uh yeah. artificial intelligence for example is making correlations that humans might not see and well, then it, it's up, yeah, then we have to figure out if the correlations are useful or not. But um, yeah, it, sure. you started this in the 70s there, already. Yeah, well, there is the potential for big data 
but my book is called Out of My Mind because exactly what you said, that humans couldn't see it when I said we have to measure functional health status, which is a person's quality of life, you can't see that, like disease gets localized. You can see pneumonia, you can see kidneys where they're affected or so forth, but functioning you couldn't see. And when I tried to convince people that we had to measure something that was invisible, most of them started to say, hang on, you're a yeah. bit crazy. Um, this is, uh, and then when you start to measure prevention, something that doesn't still exist, using the same questionnaires, they still think you're out of your mind. <laughs> yeah, tell us out of your book, out of his mind. Yeah, yeah. well, the, this, I've been trying to get these ideas up crossing all these domains of health, that is not only functioning, but uh, prevention. So there's preventive problems and what I call cared for problems, and I've, got to the age of 72 now, so these still haven't been implemented, so I decided I'd better get my life story out there, so at least uh, at least there's a record of the efforts and the ideas I had, because uh, I've all, always done this working in the real world rather than working out of a university, so it's been all my own... Uh, research and from my day-to-day -day interactions with uh, patients and uh, hospitals and other clients rather than doing university studies. Interesting. So, um, but before we forget though, uh, your book is launching right now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's launching in a day or two initially on uh, on Amazon and uh, and basically it's uh, tells my my life story as to what got me into the field how I started to uh, think about uh, these prom questionnaires and uh, my efforts to try and implement that. I spent the first 25 years trying to give it to governments, particularly the Australian government, uh, but people thought, hang on, he's talking about something that's invisible, he's out of his mind and didn't understand it. Then I realised uh, it was going, someone was going to make a lot of money out of it, so I decided I'd go there to try and, and work a business out, but not being a businessman, uh, I struggled when I came across better businessmen in this area. But the whole area has taken off in the last uh, five years in particular, but in England, in the NHS, they've been using PROMS for uh, 10 years now following four operations. And when they publish the results, the hospitals that haven't done that well in terms of their improvements in quality of life have made an effort to uh, to upgrade their skills and learn from those that are doing better. So that's part of the idea. Yeah, this um, measuring invisible things, I, I understand it's still a problem. For example, when uh, it's the East versus West medical paradigm, right? If you can't measure that's it, it doesn't exist, right? That's exactly right. For instance, um, I've had the benefits of the health system recently by having needed to have a stent put in to my heart. But in order to see that, they put contrast material into your your veins iodine so then the uh, cardiologist can look at your heart and see how wide or narrow your arteries are and if they're narrow they put a stent in to widen it well i suggest we need to put contrast material firstly into the air around us all so we start to realize that there's air around us and that is a critical part of keeping us alive and medicine sort of has looked at the body as a machine 
and not realise how interdependent we are on the connections, particularly the air, the water and the food around us. And proms reconnect us to, that, to those items outside of the body. That's so interesting. It's like, it really is, I, I really see it now as the start of, you know, the proto big data, like the fundament for, for yeah, computer science and big data and what do you call it? AI, artificial intelligence already. AI, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, medicine is based on the science of Descartes and Newton, but uh, Newton died, he was the latest to die, and he died in 1727. Since then, uh, there's been huge advances, and uh, these haven't been applied to medicine, but particularly what they call systems theory and, uh, and quantum mechanics, but least, most recently what they call complexity science, and uh, that takes into account the influences of everything. And uh, complexity science is being uh, advocated by the Santa Fe Institute in uh, New Mexico. And that was set up by some Nobel Prize winners. But set, uh, complexity science gives an explanation as to why PROMs and these questionnaires are a holistic way of looking at things and are based on science. And uh, there is a new science out there uh, that um, really is based on underlying mass of what they call power laws or the e exponential function. And uh, that uh, science does back the use of PROMs in, in medicine as well. So it's not only it has the history in the East, it has a, a Western scientific base now. Yeah, you know, it's really hard to do a one hour interview with you and your book because there is so much. I'm just going to read a couple of highlights. The theory of evolution, the chemical revolution, the industrial revolution, systems theory, quantum mechanics, relativity theory, the theory of dissipative structures, chaos theory, the Santiago theory of recognition, nonlinear dynamics, complexity theory, and complexity science, power laws, and inverse power laws. Uh, and and you, you have, uh, wait a second, there are some other chapters too. I, I want to hit those. Uh, there's some really cool ones here. Where was it? Love is in the air, supra medicine, uh, a fractal between the squares. So you think medicine is modern, a year of pain, an unmarked grave. Uh, you have so many interesting <laughs> chapters here, and I can't get yeah. to all of them. Which, which ones do we want to do first? <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, a fractal between I'm squares. Not, How about that one? Fractal, okay, a fractal between squares. So chaos theory is uh, uh, based on or what was found by a fellow called Mandelbrot yep. was his theory of fractals. I'm not sure whether you or your audience have heard of fractals. Oh, but yes. They, uh -huh. Yeah, okay, so they've been well known within the uh, artistic world because they produce pretty pictures, but underlying uh, the human body, I believe, and within the human body is a fractal coding system that I believe predated uh, DNA. And uh, every fractal is slightly different, differences provide information and so within the body we have this system i say based on fractals that provides information and it's information on experience uh, based on experience so uh but how yeah, does a fractal um, convey information because information is the distinction of differences if i said to you throughout this interview, information is the distinction of differences, information is the distinction of, 
differences in, and kept on repeating that, you would be getting no new information. Right. As every fractal is slightly different, then you are being given new information all the time. So information, according to Patterson, is the distinction of differences. And the human body does that, I say, by using, utilizing fractals. Interesting. So, but where do you see them? In the, in the uh, cell, under a microscope? They're smaller than that, uh, but there are fractals in, in motion, so you can see fractals in activity. However, when they formalize, when they take on a, a form, then you can see them in the body. So the underlying, at the bigger scale, the underlying uh, formula for fractals is a formula that develops into a tree, for instance. But in the body, we've got the respiratory system, the bronchial tree, or we've got the blood flow system, the arterial tree. All of these are probably developed by a fractal code within our DNA. It's the most likely explanation. And it's very efficient from the point of view that fractals um, have the most surface area in the minimal of space. So they, they have qualities. In fact, fractals are being used as part of your antennae in every mobile phone nowadays. Oh. So because they pick up frequencies and so forth, and they're used in lots of uh, industries to develop background for movies and so forth. They're using the imagery of fractals because you can build trees, mountains, yeah. clouds out of using the fractal theory. Yeah, it's you, you can really go exponential with that. Um, we could have a whole podcast about uh, fractals. But it's, um, I've heard it yeah. before that everything is a fractal, and I find it hard to believe. But I guess if you get down to the uh, atomic level or the one you were talking about, I guess you, is yeah. it true you can, everything is a fractal? No, I don't think everything is a fractal. In uh, complexity science, you have chaos. That is, you can call it fractals together with order. So... There's still a lot of truth in the old system and the old medicine. I think it covers 30% of, and is to that extent correct, but it's chaos together with order or fractals, if you like, together with order is that's where you get uh, what they call complexity, new things emerge and including the human body. You might stand in awe of... A, GPS uh, navigating Google Maps, for instance, mm -hmm. how they know where every car around the world is. Well, the body has some of that exponential functioning going on in it, and that's wow. why uh, we're so developed or evolved. That is, that is pretty awesome, complexity science. So let's tone it down a bit for yeah. some of the more colloquial people in our audience. There was this one really funny part of your book. In the witness box, there's this, you, you had to talk about a letter and it started off, I like you, John, as a doctor. <laughs> and uh, so yeah. why were you in the witness box and, and how does that quote keep going? <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah. Um, I was in the witness box because I, doctor colleague of mine who did study Eastern medicine, um, in, which uh, included a whole lot of slightly different than Western ways of operating, uh, had been accused of uh, being sexually mis uh, misconduct to a patient that he had been treated and he treating and he used different therapies and uh, he was taken to the medical tribunal in Australia and he asked me if I would come as a witness uh, for him, as a character witness. And uh, when I was in the witness box, the barrister handed me 
a letter from a, a patient back to him, Dr. Uh, John, we'll call him for this purposes. And uh, in that letter, she wrote, I like you, John, as a doctor, but don't send me to that masseur. That masseur is a wanker, which is Australian, maybe American, or a masturbator who wouldn't be able to do that to himself in the dark. <laughs> and, uh, and then the barrister pointed out to me a stick figure on the side and said, well, Dr. John Harrison is his name, had, had drawn this and sent the letter back to the patient. And do I think that that was very professional of Dr. Harrison? And I thought, wow, what am I going to have to think quickly here? And uh, so I had to respond to that. And I uh, thought of a fellow called Milton Erickson, who was famous for hypnosis. Yeah. And uh, he had a theory of patterning. And I said, look, this is what Erickson called patterning. And it's like if you're a salesman and you want to sell a car to someone and you find out you both play golf, well, you talk golf and that gives you a bond. And I said, this was what Dr. Harrison was trying to do with this particular uh, particular patient. And uh, but it was a, 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 <laughs> a difficult moment when I saw this letter and I had to think on my feet and uh, come up with a, a story that I felt was what Dr. Harrison was trying to to care for his patient, if you like, or form a bond with his patient. It so, didn't help his case, unfortunately. <laughs> it didn't help, huh? But are you yeah. a, are you an Erickson fan, or you were just on the spot an Erickson fan? <laughs> oh no, I've read quite a few of Erickson's books, and I am an Erickson fan. Yes. Cool. Um, I'm, I'm looking at your book. There's just so many things. One of the things that's jumping out at me is the big biff, the big bifurcation theory. What is that? Yeah. Well, in uh, complexity science, or you have things go on at a certain stage, and this is the theory of dissipating structures. Uh, you have energy coming in and energy going out, but if there's too much energy coming in, it becomes uh, unruly or becomes less stable, and then it either dissipates that it breaks down or it evolves through a bifurcation going in one of two ways and leads to a higher level. So that is a bifurcation, and it be, that's the basis of how evolution happens. So it leads to a more organized structure, is the big biff. <laughs> the big biff, I say, the big bifurcation was from non-living to living, and I have a theory that this was based on, on fractals, and once a fractal was formed and it generated information, then that information was processed in a pre-nucleus cell, in a protocell. And that is my theory on the origin of life, based on the Big Bang being the origin of, of the origin of the Earth. The Big Biff is my theory where in a, inanimate, <laughs> objects suddenly took a life and the life was in fact that they could think a little that they could uh cognate if you like yeah. so the, at the big bit then after that things could think and thinking really is information processing so you generate the information you've got to store it the cell walls will store it but the fluid of the cell allowed it to move across distance so it could be processed. So the early bacteria could say, okay, there's boiling temperature there, but down at the other end, there's lots of 
nutrients or there's a lot of glucose or lactose things that they could eat and they started to make a decision they cognated after a bifurcation that had those elements so that's my theory on the origin of life <laughs> that's interesting I, I have to ask you where did you learn all this stuff because this is way beyond a normal doctor it's more like physicist or scientist or nostradamus you know <laughs> <laughs> Um, it was uh, it evolved from trying to improve the health system and doctors objecting initially they objected to the fact that proms these questionnaires were subjective measures they said these were opinions and science is based on facts material things and so I went looking for the science and that's that list of scientific theories so I read and read and read and uh, looking for the science that would explain why PROMS was in fact based on science and it took me on this wonderful journal journey. So my first book, uh, Is Medicine Really Necessary, said we're measuring the wrong things. My second book, uh, which was called Supra Medicine, which is saying the medicine looks at the subsystems of the body but, uh, such as the cardiovascular, neurological, but there's systems above the body like the family, the air, the environment, and so forth. So I said there's a whole lot of medicine above the body. So that was called supra medicine. Mm -hmm. And the third book looked at the, the underlying science, and that led me into complexity science to answer the doctor's. As, uh, objection that it wasn't based on science. So I went to look for the science that explained why PROMS was in fact based on science. And in fact, PROMS, I feel, is an early proxy for measuring everything that's going on at the fractal level. Okay, but how do you get that out of a questionnaire? You, you were talking about psychometrics and stuff like that. So that there's a little bit yeah. of magic in there when I hear that, I because it's just totally over my head. Yeah, yeah. Well, the, the questionnaire is still based on what they call linear science, but the questionnaire asks people, "How does your illness affect you in your daily life? Does the pain interfere from you concentrating at work, or interfere from you walk?" walking up steps so there is reconnecting things and all these hidden connections these invisible connections were lost in uh, in medicine but they are reconnected in these later sciences so all these later sciences reconnect everything together so that's the basis of uh, what they call multi-agent theory. Everything is affecting everything else. And that is within chaos theory, how the, uh, the, the theory of sensitive dependence on initial conditions or the butterfly effect arose from everything affecting everything else. Okay, can you give us one of these, an example of one of these connections and, and then how your questionnaire is tied into that? Um, well, the question is, connects, so it asks you questions like your connection with your daily life. So, for instance, how does your illness affect you performing your work, your playing with your kids and so forth? Yeah. So, and it asks these questions over the last week or the last month. So, for instance, if somebody goes into hospital, well, their illness has affected them in their daily life. They're not going to work. They're not playing with their kids. They're not doing so. In fact, every hospital admission slightly reduces your quality of life initially because you are now disconnected from, from your day-to-day -day activity. So, in fact, based on proms of these questionnaires, every hospital admission um, does do some harm initially. So mm -hmm. we're supposed to do no harm, but using proms, it has showed up over the years 
that every hospital admission there's a slightly a slight reduction in your prom score. The idea is to make it better after the treatment. But uh, so that's one way area where proms have pointed out that uh, every hospital admission causes a little bit of harm because you're no longer connected to your day-to-day -day activities. Interesting. There was also a big Greek word about that, homeostate or do no harm. What was it? Do you remember? Uh, uh, first, do no harm. There's uh, prose nos there. <laughs> Yeah. There, I, I'm not sure of the Latin, uh, the Latin thing, but yeah, one of Hippocrates' uh, e edicts was first, do no harm. Yeah, and that's what we as doctors are supposed to do. But uh, another theory that comes up from more the business side of my readings was there was a theory called re-engineering by a fellow called Michael Hammer was once thought of one of the leading thinkers. And he said, okay, because there's such evolution, if you want to do something and change the corporation, you should go back to the blank slate. Now I'm saying governments need to go back to what they call the blank state. And if you today were going to set up a, a government, you'd have a health department, a transport department, education, justice, uh, a business department. Where would you put wellness? Where would you put well-being? And if you look at the world today, who does wellness or well-being? Hmm. I would put it in the health department. That's where it belongs. However, the health system, that is doctors and hospitals, do almost nothing on wellness. Hmm. So it's been placed in the, in the wrong department and continues today. So all the wellness is done by companies getting their employees fit. Doctors should be getting their patients fit. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's... You uh... understand what I... Yeah, it's pretty profound. Uh, <laughs> but like said, uh, still going, still going on today. If you look around the world, I don't know what it's like in Hamburg or in, uh, in Europe, but most wellness programs are not run by doctors. And that if, for instance, in Australia we have twenty-five thousand primary care physicians, if all of them did wellness, that is, tried to help prevent illness by offering their patients lifestyle prescriptions to stop smoking, to reduce weight, to eat better diets, then, uh, then we would have a true health system. The health systems still remain disease systems and wellness exists outside. Yeah, so this is interesting because you started with... Um well, let's call it a tool that really maybe revolutionized the industry and definitely, definitely improved a lot of things. <clears throat> but now you're talking about the political level and that, that is much harder to change. And uh, <clears throat> I don't even know where you, where you would start at that level, putting the, the wellness back into the health system. I mean... Well, w we have what we call preventive proms, that is a questionnaire that, we, that the doctor assigns to their patient, asking them about their smoking habits, their, their weight, their alcohol intake, things that, the, yes, the political level usually ask, but the doctor should be asking their own patient. And, uh, and then once they do that, then they should start to prescribe lifestyle prescriptions rather than drugs or expensive x-rays. People yeah. estimate today that 30% of what the health system does is wasted and uh, <laughs> it probably probably is because they don't do the prevention or the wellness or the well-being. That's outside their domain and it's got to be brought back in and I believe PROMS preventive proms can be the catalyst to do that.
So let's uh, apply Pareto to that. What's the 80-20 now of the healthcare industry or, yeah. Well, if you want to change the healthcare system, you've got to look at the key, the key change agents. And that, in my opinion, is people see what doctors do and what the large teaching hospitals do. So doctors have to start to do uh, uh, wellness or prevention, and the proms can do that. And in Australia now, uh, they're just starting a system under a payment to doctors for the first time to collect data on their percentage of their population of patients, that is the primary care physicians who smoke, who are overweight and so <laughs> forth. And PROMS will, will help that. So this is coming in on the 1st of August and the, uh, the app or the startup I'm building based on my ideas has that in there. So uh, we hope that will work that way. But health is also an unusual product because the suppliers of health care from an economic point of view are the doctors. But the people who create the demand for health care are also the doctors in terms of expense because the doctors put people in hospital, the doctors uh, order the expensive tests and so mm -hmm. forth. So it's a business where there's a different supply and demand situation compared to <laughs> other, other professions. So the doctor can be the supplier, but then demand. So if the doctor also owns the hospital or the x-ray facility or whatever, then you've got a pretty good business model, but not such a good healthcare model. Yeah, well, there's, you know, in America, there's the big, the big pharma, I, I wouldn't call it a conspiracy theory at all, uh, you know, how the doctors are prescribing the medicines that they're sponsored by the whoever, you know, the, the pharmaceutical company. But, um, sure. well, yeah, that's another that, rabbit hole. That, yeah, yeah, well, that arises very much uh, out of the doctors just doing, treating people when they're, when they're sick and not doing any of the prevention. But uh, once they, prevention or wellness, but once via what I call preventive proms, this will come back to the, healthcare system, then we will have doctors doing uh, both prevention and caring. And uh, once they do that, they and get paid for prevention, then there should be less of big pharma. But yes, there is a huge, huge influence and they're very strong politically uh, yeah. to influence how the world goes. Okay. Yeah, it's uh, that's uh, we could uh, spend another hour on that one, <laughs> but um, sure. I, I want to get back to some of the more techie stuff. So there's one part in your book uh, in the back. It says somaplasticity, not only neuroplasticity. Can you explain that? Yeah. Well, there's the world's moved after a fellow called Deutsch uh, wrote a book, The Brain That Changes Itself, and everybody worked out that the, uh, the the brain was much more plastic, more adaptable than it was before. And then he wrote another book, uh, The Brain That Heals. So neuroplasticity has been accepted. I say it, it, this applies to the whole of the human body is much more plastic than medicine believes. So soma is any cells of the body, not just the brain cells. So if somebody has a slip disc, I would say that that is not necessarily totally a material thing. It is more plastic than modern medicine, so-called modern medicine believes, and it can probably go back into place by being aware that it is more plastic or more adaptable and uh, so forth for other parts of the body. It is not as solid or as material or as definite as the modern or so-called modern medicine approach to it is. So I would be less rapid to 
operate on things which are more plastic and can in fact change or heal themselves with less uh, less invasive treatments. Hmm. Yeah, uh, I think we're going to have to do another podcast because every every time you answer, it just goes exponential. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, sorry about that. No, no, no. It's a, it's a wealth of information. It took me on a, a, a wide journey that I never knew I would go on. All I wanted to do was to improve the health system, but I think PROMs actually measure part of the patient. They mm-hmm. measure the patient's quality of life, and I think uh, it goes further than health, in fact. Uh, You might have heard that New Zealand just introduced in the end of May what they call a well-being budget. Hmm. So they're not just talking about money, they're talking about well-being. And the OECD has got some excellent articles on measuring well-being. So PROMS measures well-being in health, but there are other areas that use a lot of these questionnaires in other areas as well. And I think what's happening in New Zealand will get, eventually go viral around the world. People won't only concentrate on the gross domestic product. We'll look at gross health product, the gross educational product. And I think, funnily enough, these short questionnaires will play a role in being the catalyst to this move. Yeah, that's that would be cool. <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, but you know, I wanted to tell you, uh, it's pretty uh, mind-boggling and world-moving what you've already done. You know, everybody's always talking about making a difference and changing the world, and it's uh, it's really interesting how you started and you really did have such a big impact. So I want you to keep writing books no matter what and keep uh, writing and writing and, and giving us that information because I'm loving it. And uh, I'm yeah. just, I'm still processing it. I, you know, I, I can't even, uh, uh, but it's, uh, it's pretty amazing. Um, and I'm just, yeah, well, the, what I want to do is to get it out in the real world. And that's why I'm, I'm developing an uh, an app and a startup, and uh, if you've got any uh, investors who want to invest, I think this will also go go viral. Uh, so uh, I'm happy to write more books, but I'd like to see this come out as a practicality, and that's what our our app does, but not being a businessman, if you've got any businessmen, entrepreneurs who are interested, uh, yeah. Well, tell, tell, us we, tell us about your app. Tell us about the app and the, the startup. App. Yeah, well, uh, the app is an app that develops these uh, these proms, these questionnaires, and there's about 2,000 of them have been used and accepted around the world, but we are developing our own, particularly in the preventive prom space. But the app is an app that is designed to give to those Pareto people, that is the doctor assigns the questionnaire to the patient and the app does this by allowing the doctor to send these short questionnaires to the patient's mobile phone, the patient completes the questionnaire on their phone, that results in a measure or a score, and it may give them a score for their physical health, their mental health, their social health. And uh, then based on that score, the doctor then would say to them, even if they're healthy, where physical health on this measure that is the promise 10, the population norm is 50. But even if you're at 50, the doctor can encourage you to get to 55. And if you get to 60, which is one standard deviation above the norm on physical health, you have zero chance of being hospitalized in the next six months. You've got to be pretty fit and healthy to get to 60. But I say if a doctor can get you to 60, 
then uh, you have what I call a behavioral vaccine against heart attack and stroke and probably against 40% of cancers as well. That is very interesting. So you got an, what's the name of the app? The app is, it's the company is called eHealthier and the app within eHealthier is called the ePROMS, Electronic Patient Reported Outcome Measures. And uh, yeah, but there's a website eHealthier.net that explains the beginning and I would need to send uh, some brochures out somewhere to explain more of the, uh, of the, uh, of the app. But this is basically trying to, or implementing uh, the ideas set out in my books, uh, mm -hmm. but doing it via what I consider the Pareto key functionary in that, and that is by doctors and hospitals starting to assign these. Because these questionnaires, I've realized, in fact, are really a new set of diagnostic tests but everyone's scared to mention the word diagnostic test due to medical negligence uh, mm. possibilities there. So we call it a new form of health assessment. But if it is a diagnostic test, then it ought to be issued by people such as doctors and uh, hospitals because mm -hmm. that's what it's all about. Do you have any patents? I have... I need to, but it costs a lot of money to yes, get it. it does. But, uh, we're getting to the stage uh, where where there's some of our our own proms that we've developed ourselves. We need to patent it as well as the process of doing it. So I would see this whole area of well-being, uh, starting in the health area, uh, will start to uh, go viral and uh, my prediction is that it's likely to be the next uh, the next Facebook or so forth. It has that <laughs> potential because yeah. we're all after trying to improve our well-being or our quality of life. Well, I want to reserve some stock when you guys go public, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay. Well, uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. I think if somebody's going to go public around the corner, it may not be us because I don't have the business acumen, but I enjoy the journey inevitably. I know some businessmen. I'll try to hook you up with them because it sounds, I mean, I, I think it sounds really great and valuable, but, uh, you know, okay. I can't, I can't, uh, I can't really, yeah. you know. Um, on the lighter side, um, do you have a favorite author? Um, well, I avidly read textbooks. Um, so <laughs> my favorite author would probably be somebody, you know, a book I read on complexity called uh, Mitchell Waldock, but uh, people like Glick who wrote the book on chaos. So I like books that be, bring science to the public. Mm -hmm. uh, Bill Bryson wrote a beautiful book on the uh, history of the world, mm -hmm. which uh, was able to simplify the history of science. Um, but uh, I'm a textbook reader, uh, wow. avid reader of textbooks and a very minimal reader of uh, novels and, mm -hmm. and fiction. So what, what is your favorite book? Uh, Complexity by Mitchell Waldorf. Okay. All right, I will have to put that in the show notes. How do you spell it? Okay. Complexity by Michael or Mitchell? By Mitchell, Mitchell Waldoff, I think. W A L D O double F, I think, or maybe. Yeah, I think okay. that's how he spells his name. I have to go to my library and look it up. And but do you have any books? <laughs> no, you don't. books that explain, explain the scientific theory taking into account the scientist's own personal life gives you a flavor of a nice way of digesting the scientific theories. Yeah, yeah, but um, now I lost my thread again. Wait a second. Okay. Sorry. 
No, no problem. No problem. I was bipping around in the questions and my fault. So, so do you have um, a, a health tip or a health hack that somebody, any, everybody can do right away? Um, a health hack to do right away. My first hack would be uh, number one: be uh, be wary of uh, of your traditional doctor's advice, and uh, I guess number two: um, yeah, look after your lifestyle. Everything is about the lifestyle, and uh, and whatever you can do to him. To understand your psychology better is worthwhile. So I would think some psychological in investigations. But uh, my friend who I went to court with, uh, John Harrison, a doctor, has a, a uh, I think, a, a, what do you call it, a web thing out there called Third Millennium Health. And uh, he sets out a way of uh, looking after your health there. I think it's called M3 Health. Hmm. It costs about $100 to get the, uh, the program, but he talks you through a way of doing uh, preventive health care, particularly with a psychological focus. Interesting. I just thought of um, Nassim Taleb. Have you heard of him? Not only have I heard of him, I... Uh, I've met him and uh, tried to get him on board because uh, his books, number one, his book, Black Swan, is dedicated to Mandelbrot. Yep. So the same theory. So uh, he now works out at the New York uh, University in Brooklyn and I've been uh, to his office and uh, I was in the lift with him actually and I, he looked too young. <laughs> and I said, has anyone told you you look like, because he dresses like a student with a T-shirt and, uh, <laughs> and unkempt, if you like. And I said, has anyone said you look like Nassim Talib? He said, yeah, lots of people. <laughs> like who? And I, and I got out <laughs> like Nassim Talib. Oh, yeah. And they <laughs> got out. That was him at the floor of his office, and uh, <laughs> I was I was visiting his associate there. Uh, Tapiero, Charles Tapiero, they work a bit in the complexity science area. A lot of they do for business is based around Mandelbrot and complexity science. Anyway, I said to Taleb, I was born in Lebanon because he's originally of Greek Lebanese origin. Yeah. Um, but yes, we're speaking the same language. I gave him my book, but unfortunately, my last book that is. So you think medicine is modern, yep. um, but I'm sure he didn't he didn't read it. But I did run into him twice or three times in New York, and he referred to me as Professor Price. But uh, I've never been a professor. But anyway, uh, <laughs> well. we certainly have met, and I'm a big, big admirer of some of his work, and it's all based on the same uh, same science he's applying it yep. to uh, other things rather than just medicine mm -hmm. but he has a couple of chapters in his book on anti-fragility on on medicine yeah he um he's i think he's my new favorite author but um he dedicates a lot of his books to uh, you shall first do no harm and um uh, it overlaps with what you just said a lot. And uh, also, uh, what is it called? The Bed of Proscustus? Do you know how to say it? No, I don't, I don't it, know it, that particular it, statement. But I've got these books filled by randomness, um, yeah. the uh, anti-fragility, and I've met him two or three times yeah. and been to some of his... Uh, his lectures, but yes, basically we come down to the same underlying science applying uh, uh, around and uh, his first book, The Big Seller, Black Swan, was yeah. dedicated to Mandelbrot. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, yeah, if you ask me if there was anyone I'd like to meet and spend time with, well, I was fortunate enough to meet Mandelbrot before he died for an really? hour and a half because, of, yeah. Yeah. And uh, in Boston, and uh, explained my theories, and he encouraged me to 
continue working that way. The other person I'd really uh, like to get together with in a more practical sense is Professor Michael Porter from Harvard Business School, who's a much better advocate for proms in terms of the, having the backing of Harvard Business School behind him. Michael Port. But, uh, Mundell brought, if, if Mundell brought, if he was alive, he would be the person I'd like to spend a couple of days with. <laughs> cool. Yeah, me too, for sure. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to have to look up that bed of Procustus. It's it's um, really funny. I've it's, heard the some. Yeah. It's about an old Greek. Of course, it's an old Greek dude, right? And he had a hotel. Yeah. Three thousand years yeah. ago. And the beds were always the perfect size for his clients or his visitors because he would saw their legs off to fit the bed. <laughs> <You know? laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's a lot of what we do in the world, unfortunately. Yeah. So your book is free right now? It's free now from the Kindle version for a day or two, I think. And uh, then you can get the paperback version or the uh, Kindle version at reasonable prices on Amazon. Sure. Okay. And um, what was the website you were talking about? E-Health? e E-Health, net. Mm -hmm. Where do you want people to reach you? Well, and they can reach me via ehealthier.net, uh, probably is the best. But also at the back of my book, I've got uh, a page suggesting where they can make contact with me. But uh, ehealthier.net is, is fine, or my email address at ehealthier, which is Eddie Price at ehealthier.net. Eddie double D I E price no dot between that at ehealthier.net is my email address. Thank you so much, Dr. Eddie. And Out of His Mind by Dr. Eddie Price is free right now. So go get it, everyone. And uh, Dr. Eddie, thanks again. I, I uh, Pleasure. Thank you. I want to reserve you for about five podcasts because we have a lot to talk about. But thanks again for your time. And I look forward to talking to you. Happy to do it. Any, any time, happy to do it. All right. That sounds Appreciate great. It. I mean, we're going to get into right. Mandelbrot and all of it. <laughs> okay. Thanks okay. again. Already. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Bye. Okay, my friends, if you like that podcast, then remember to go to zbooks.co and go get all the materials to start your authoring career. We have a seven-day challenge every week, so there's no excuse to not finish your book. And remember, please go to iTunes and upload this podcast and Google Play. Okay, I look forward to seeing you at the top.